um, and a little bit about macroeconomics. So one of the things I want to, t to make sure you understand is that uh, we can use economic tools to talk about non-market sectors, just like we're using economic tools to talk about market sectors. The big th thing about non-market sectors is we don't have prices. So we, we have to find the equivalent of prices. That is, we need to find out what, how much society values these non-market things. But just because we don't have prices doesn't mean the non-market values are zero. So one of the things that, that there's been a lot of advances on is trying to figure out how to put prices on environmental services. And so this is something which we are now very good at doing. And so we can, now that we know what the, the values of non-market services are, we can think about non-market things just like we think about market things. What kind of a changes can we make to non-market sectors where the benefits exceed the costs? We can still look at that concept. So let's talk about some of these non-market sectors. Uh, one of the non-market sectors that's, a, that's prominent uh, in people's minds is health. Uh, why do we talk about health? Because people care a lot about their health. It turns out uh, that that has very high values to people. It, it's not um, necessarily something that's in the market economy, but if you ask people what's important to them, health is often one of the very first things they'll mention. That this is an extremely important parameter for me. So one of the questions is, what does climate change have to do with health? Most of climate change is impacts on ecosystems. And so they're not health related. But there are examples where uh, climate change is going to have a health effect. So what examples do we have? That we, we know that there's going to be some consequences to diseases through the changes in ecosystems. So that there's going to be changes in where diseases actually occur across the planet. So that's one thing we're going to worry about. Another thing we're going to worry about is ozone. It turns out that it forms more rapidly in warmer environments. So it's, that's another thing that's going to happen. Heat stress, uh, there's a concern that heat stress might change. And if it gets worse, if there's more heat stress, we know that that has big health effects. What's true about cold spells is just the opposite. We know a lot of people currently die from freezing. If, if it gets warmer, the less people will do that. Less die, will die from that. So one of the things that's going to go on is the vector-borne diseases. These are diseases which are carried by, through the ecosystem, will change as ecosystems change. So as an ecosystem that, carry, that is capable of supporting a vector-borne disease moves because of climate change, the diseases that are part of that ecosystem will move with it. So mosquitoes don't all cause malaria, but if you get mosquitoes that last long enough, that survive long enough, they can carry the, the malaria disease with them, and then they can infect people. If it turns out the, the warming makes the territory where those mosquito-borne diseases can, can live expand into new places that it, they don't currently exist in, the disease will expand. So that's, that's what vector-borne diseases are all about. Uh, so that's a concern. The ozones, the warmer temperatures, and then the heat spells and cold spells clearly also depend on temperature. So what can we do to adapt to these things? It turns out there's been a lot of studies in health about the potential risk, the potential deaths that would occur. There's surprisingly little studies about how you cope with them. And I find this very bizarre because most of the studies of potential risks come out of public health departments. And public health departments is precisely who learns or who knows about how to adapt. So for some reason, we are just not doing adaptation work in public health, but we should be. This is something that we, that we definitely should be spending resources on. Why is that? It's because a lot of these diseases are very controllable. It's just a question of, of spending some resources on controlling them. How do I know that? You know, there's a big, they, when people try to scare the United States, they say, look, if it gets warmer, malaria is going to come and be in the United States and you'll all get malaria. Well, I got news for you. When Americans first, well, what, when Europeans first discovered America, Malaria was there. It was already there. So malaria is not new to the United States. It's always been there. It's just we wiped it out. We have controlled it. How do you control it? One way you control it is you can control the vector itself. So one thing that we do is we control the mosquito that causes it. How do we do that? We spray. We kill it. That's the famous DDT approach. Uh, we just wipe it out. So that's one way that you can control it. You can, you can spray insecticides, limit the, the vector that's causing it. What else can you do? Another thing you can do is you can limit your contact. 
with, with the vector. So that's the mosquito net. Why is that a mosquito net so exciting? It's, it's cool technology while it's really sophisticated. Not so cool, but it, it's exciting because $10 buys you a mosquito net. So what does that mean? If you, it can, if you have a mosquito net during the time the mosquitoes normally bite humans, you don't get bit. So if you don't get bit, you don't get the disease. It's a cheap alternative, $10. You save a household or save a, a, a person who sleeps in a, in a particular place. One of the things that's very exciting about these, some of these alternatives is it, you don't have to get very much wealthier to decide you can definitely afford this kind of adaptation. And what else can you do? Uh, you can have repellents on yourself rather than killing them everywhere. You can just make it unattractive for the mosquito to come approach you. So that's another relatively cheap thing to do. And then what else can you do? If you get malaria, you can treat it. So what's, what's wrong with malaria? Well, one of the problems with, this, with malaria is if you're sick and another mosquito bee bites you, it gets infected, it spreads the disease, it becomes worse. If you're treated, if everybody gets treated, it turns out there's nobody who's going to, it makes it very much more difficult for the disease to spread. So there, there's lots of relatively inexpensive ways to reduce most of the vector-borne diseases so that they become incredibly rare. Now, because there are inexpensive ways to do this, one of the things that we predict is that as people's incomes rise, just because of economic development, most countries will control vector-borne diseases by the time climate changes. So by 2050, we're expecting most of these vector-borne diseases will largely be under control. Because the only reason you're not doing it is, is, is the, you, you can't afford the, the expensive things now. But they're not that expensive. So what we're predicting is there'll be huge increases in public health. We'll control a lot of these vector-borne diseases. They're not going to be a very big threat in the future. So although climate change will move their territory around, and although public health people in the new territory have to be informed about what they have to do about it, it's actually going to be relatively inexpensive to do, have a public health adaptation to vector-borne disease. So this is an area we, we, we don't have enough research going on. For some reason, the public health people don't want to touch this. But th this is an important Do you understand that th there are lots of opportunities to do adaptation in public health. OK. What about ozone control? Once you get the precursors of, of ozone, nitrogen oxides and VOCs, once they're in the atmosphere, they, they turn into ozone. So nitrogen oxide and VOCs themselves are, are relatively harmless. But when they get together and they get a little sunshine and a little warm temperatures, they form ozone. And ozone's not good for you. It's not the worst thing in the world that we, we put it in the atmosphere. But it, there's a lot of evidence now that it, it increases mortality. It contributes to morbidity. And it definitely does things like increases asthma attacks and, and minor uh, eye, eye and ear irritation. So ozone is a bad thing. It also damages crops. It damages trees. We don't want ozone to go out of control. So one of the things we're worried about, climate change gets a little warmer. It, ozone will form more rapidly. And so it might become a more serious problem in the future than it already is. So what do we have to do? The primary thing we have to do is control the precursors. Right at the moment, we control them both, both VOCs and NOx. It, that, that may not always be the wisest way to do this. It could be sufficient to control one of them, whichever one is easier to control. Uh, if you get rid of either one of them, you, you turn out you, can, you, you prevent the ozone from forming. But in any case, the idea is that we can do emissions controls. This is standard air pollution stuff. This is a government responsibility. It's not something the private sector is going to do without government help. And what, are we, what kind of help do they need? Regulations. I mean, they need incentives to, to uh, actually do something about this. But this is, again, a manageable problem. It's something that's got to be done, but it can, it's manageable. What else do we have? Uh, another problem that is a growing problem that was part of that, uh, he, the extreme event story is heat waves. Now, heat waves are not absolute temperatures. Heat waves are extraordinary temperatures for a particular place. So what does that mean? You get a, a no normal day here in, in Bangkok, and it's 90 degrees, and everybody says, well, this is a nice day, because it's like every other day. You don't see people dying from heat waves that are everyday temperatures. But you put a 90-degree day in a place that's used to 
temperatures in the 50s, and all of a sudden that's an unbearably hot day if it comes all of a sudden. So what happens when you get sudden increases in temperature is that puts a huge stress on people's bodies, and th they die from heat waves. And what, what's, what you can see quite clearly is temporary deaths, short-term deaths, acute deaths, go up rapidly when you get these episodes of very high temperatures. Now, one of the confusions people have is they think, well, if there's global warming and all the temperatures get higher, there'll be a lot more deaths from heat waves. But actually, that's not quite right. It's extraordinary temperatures relative to the average temperature that's actually killing people. So not everybody in Bangkok is dying because the temperatures are 90 degrees Fahrenheit. In, it, you're used to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, so it, it, nothing's happening. It's only when you get a temperature you're not used to. So we'll be talking about that later. Uh, you know, we're talking about the Pacific case of India. It, it turns out 90 degrees is not going to kill lots of people in India, especially southern India, because it's not that hot. But if you get temperatures that are unusually hot in India, it will kill them. So it, it's the question of will you see more extraordinary days compared to your average days? There's no evidence in the climate science that we will. It might happen, but, but it's not obvious in the climate models. They're not predicting it at the moment. But that's something that could happen. What can you do about it if it does happen? Uh, well, we'll talk about some specific things you can do that have to do with, with warning systems. But the other, what else can you do? You can invest in cooling. Now, there's all sorts of investments you can make in cooling. You know, one investment is you can buy a $2 fan and, and fan yourself. And that, that's an inexpensive investment. But that is an investment. That is something that works. You can buy a fan that blows air. That works. So that when we're talking about cooling, they can be inexpensive cooling things. You can build buildings with tall ceilings. That also is, a, is, a, is an example of trying to make the building cooling because the heat can rise and, and its temperatures more comfortable in the lower parts of the building. There are lots of examples where you can increase cooling inexpensively. You also can spend a lot of money on cooling. You can actually do air conditioning. And, and we, we heard very right in the beginning of this talk, in the beginning of this conference, that sometimes we're going to spend a lot of money on cooling. And one of the things that, that we're worried about a little bit is one of the adaptations to heat waves, to very high temperatures, is that people will invest a lot more in cooling. They invest a lot more in cooling. They'll have a lot more cooling capacity. They'll turn it on a lot more. And you'll spend a lot of your energy on cooling. And right now, most of the energy that's spent on cooling is done in rich countries. But one of the things that's very apparent is that as people become wealthier in every country, they will spend more money on cooling. So one of the things that we, we are already seeing in low latitude countries is as individuals become wealthier, you're seeing more people investing in cooling than before. One of the things you should expect that as you, every country in the low latitudes develops, that cooling is going to become a bigger part of their energy package. So this is an interesting example where you're adapting to the high temperatures by buying cooling. That makes you much more comfortable, takes you away from, from heat wave risks. But what is that doing? It's increasing the demand for electricity. And that's not exactly what we had in mind for mitigation. So this is an example where the, the right adaptation to deal with the high temperatures is actually something that actually makes mitigation more difficult because you're going to be using more energy. And the, and the amount of extra energy you can use could be a lot, this could, as the examples we, we heard um, in the very early part of, this, of the conference could be that you're, you're going to end up spending a lot of money on cooling. It might not be obvious to you yet that that's what's going to happen, but one of the things we're projecting is you, we're, we're projecting a lot more cooling in, in low, income, low latitude countries. As they become wealthier, they're going to spend a lot more money on this. Um, okay. So what else can you do? Um, you can spend a lot of money on structures, but one of the things that's true about heat waves is they're temporary. So one of the things you might want is temporary reprieves for people, temporary places people can go in extraordinary days where they can get protection. So who are we particularly worried about? We're particularly worried about people who are not particularly well, that they're, they're very vulnerable anyway, they're sick, and we're worried about the elderly who are fragile. Um, so what we're talking about is having places they could go in days which are extraordinarily high in temperature where they can be protected. 
And, and the protection could be relatively simple. It could just be going to, in the United States, one of the things people do is they go to the mall. Um, why do you go to the mall? Our malls are air conditioned. They're, they're protection. So you might be very poor. You can't afford to have air conditioning yourself. But you can afford to walk around in the mall because it's free. Um, so that turns out malls turn out to be a refuge for the elderly. If they can get to the mall, that's, that's a form of protection. So one of the things is whether you create um, protection places where people could go, where, it, where they'll be safe um, from high temperatures. What's another thing you can do? You can change some of your behavior. So again, the, this is something we talked about very early. If you are willing to get up really early in the morning here, you can join the rest of the people from Bangkok and exercise at 5.30 in the morning uh, out, out in the park. Um, why are they doing that at 5.30 in the morning? Why do they only wait till 1 o'clock in the afternoon when the, the light's all bright and cl clear? Because it gets really hot here. It's unpleasant to exercise in the afternoon. But if you're in a cold place, you wait to the afternoon to get warmer before you go outside. So you, you, you would change your behavior. So a lot of the adaptations to, to high temperatures are actually just being a little more thoughtful about your behavior. If you have a day that's extraordinarily high temperature, you simply take it easy. Uh, and by taking it easy, you avoid high exercises. You avoid doing exercises in the middle of the day. These are all things that if you're already in a hot country, you say, well, what's that? That's, we do that. We do that anyway. And that's, that's because you've adapted already. But if you're in a cold country and you're trying to figure out how you possibly could survive in a high country, hot country, well, you guys can, can just go visit them and, and clue them in. Because uh, you already know how you can do that. So changes in behavior are, are going to turn out to be uh, other ways you can avoid uh, heat wave deaths. So one of the things that we just talked about is energy for cooling. One of the things that we, we do expect is that there's going to be a dramatic increase in energy. So we look at that as actually being an impact in the energy sector, but actually it's an adaptation to hotter temperatures. That's really what it is. It's a consequence of adaptation. Um, what's going to happen to energy for heating? Energy for heating is actually going to disappear. As temperatures get warmer, your winters are going to get shorter. They're going to be milder. You don't have to spend as much money on, on heating. So that's going to be a benefit. So the cooling is going to be a damage. The heating is going to be a benefit. It depends on where you are, wh whether the heating is going to be more important than the cooling. If you're in a very cold place right now, the savings you get in the heating will be bigger than, than the, the, uh, the damages associated with, with cooling. But if you're in the low latitudes, which, which most of you are, it's the opposite. The cooling is going to be a much bigger damage than the heating is going to be a benefit. So in general, the idea is that warming is going to be lead to damages in the energy sector. And I think that's something that most of you will face. Unless you happen to be a very cold place, most of you are going to face uh, warming as being something that's going to add damages in the energy sector. Tourism. So this is a different thing. So we have people go who are tourists for lots of reasons. So you watch the people here in Bangkok. Some of them are, are shopping. Uh, are they affected by climate change? No. Uh, you know, it turns out you can do very good shopping indoors, no matter what the temperature looks like outside, or whether it's raining or it's not raining. Doesn't it's not going to affect you. So the shopping industry in Bangkok is going to survive climate change. But what happens if people are coming to Thailand to go to the beaches? Well, the beaches currently are, are very pleasant places to go, but suppose Thailand gets very very hot and the beaches become unpleasant. That will affect tourism to, to Thailand. So. One of the things that's true is outdoor recreation is very climate sensitive. And, and so that's one of the things that we expect. And one of the places that we see it most dramatically is in winter sports, uh, places where people like to go skiing. They're going to be impacted by warming. So the, the skiing resorts are going to have a harder time making snow. That's going to make the skiing less, less attractive. The season's going to be shorter. It's going to be less pleasant. There's going to be damages in the ski resorts. We know that from warming. What about the rest of recreation? It turns out that 80% or so of current recreation is actually during warm times of the year. What's going to happen if things warm? In general, the season to do recreation is going to increase. It's going to get bigger. Because it, it, you'll have an earlier spring and a later fall where you still can have recreation. The place where you might run into trouble is in the peak summer. If the peak summer becomes too hot, you'll lose that. But it's not clear outdoor recreation is going to go down. We actually think outdoor recreation is going to increase, probably, because of climate change. 
But what else is going to happen with outdoor recreation? Another thing that's going to happen with outdoor recreation is some of it is tied to ecosystems. So as ecosystems change, uh, outdoor recreation is going to be sensitive to that. So if people are coming to see a particular wildlife and that wildlife has decided they don't want to stay here anymore, they're going to move someplace else, well, then you're out of luck. You can't show that wildlife in that local area. But what will happen to tourism, tourism will follow the wildlife wherever it goes. So that's something that you should expect. As ecosystems migrate, that the tourism that's tied to ecosystems will migrate with it. So depending on whether it's coming towards you or it's moving away from you, you'll either look at that as a benefit or you'll look at that as a damage. So the, the, the question is, is what will the, how will that affect other types of ecosystem? One of the other things that we're, we're worried about is increases in sea temperatures and increases in ocean acidification. Um, that will be bad for coral reefs. Both, both things are supposed to be bad. The, and so if, you're, if your tourism is tied to coral reefs, it's going to be very vulnerable to these changes. So that's, that's something we're terribly worried about. We're not cl absolutely clear whether that's going to be different in different parts of the ocean. Uh, my guess is that it probably will vary depending on the location of, of, of where you are. But most of you who are in islands, you know you can't move your island. So whatever's happening in your place is what matters to you. So for some people, this is going to be a damage. For other people, it might be a benefit. Um, but that's one of the things that we're terribly worried about. What about we're also worried about? We're, we're worried about the loss of some endangered species. As, as ecosystems shift and go from one place to another, it's not clear that species which are already vulnerable already might get wiped out. It's not clear that they're going to make it, that they're going to make the adjustment to, to the, the new world that's going to eventually unfold. So if you have uh, tourism that's tied to a charismatic species, people want to come see a Bengali t a tiger, or uh, I, I just went to see the condors in Peru, uh, these are gigantic birds. Uh, if, if for some reason climate change in Peru wipes them out, then the place where people currently go to look at these condors is going to be out of luck. So this is another great concern when it comes to uh, tourism. All right. What, can you, what kinds of adaptations can we do? Well, one thing is you can manage the ecosystem so they can make the transition through these changes. So if you have sufficient territory uh, and you know the tiger is going to move from being here, they're going to move to up there, the idea is you make it possible for those tigers to move. You, you make sure that it's not just you, put, you do a fence around where they currently are, but you move that fence as, as the ecosystems shift so that they're protected throughout the entire transition from one place to another. And what that means is that instead of thinking as conservation as being incredibly place specific and stationary, you have to think of conservation as something that's now going to be dynamic, that actually moves. You have to reconceive how you're going to protect species. And so that's something that, that's going to be uh, fundamental to protecting the tourism tied to conservation, protecting the values that are associated with conservation. The idea is that we're going to have to rethink about conservation and, and start to develop dynamic approaches to this rather than stationary. What else might happen? Well, it, as much as some places might become um, too hot, some places which are currently too cold might suddenly become much more attractive. So what does that mean? Places that nobody wants to go right now because they're too cold, they might want to go in the future. Uh, so there might be some opportunities to develop new, um, new places for tourists to go, new, new things for them to see that are associated with changes. So not all changes are necessarily going to be bad for the ecosystem. The idea is that if you have a bad one, a bad outcome, you might be able to manage it. But it's also going to be true that you might have new opportunities. So the idea is the ecosystems are going to be different. That also is an opportunity. It's not just a bad thing that you've lost also a chance to gain something. So one of the things that is true in the ecosystem area is to think about, to try to be a little more lighter on your feet uh, in, in protecting ecosystems. Currently, we, we're very, we have this idea that we're planted in place. Everything we're protecting is the stuff right around us, and it's not going to move. The idea is to be a little bit lighter. If the ecosystem moves over there, you hop over there. You, you now stand in a new place. The idea is, is to be able to adapt with the ecosystem, move with them help them move, rather than think that our purpose is keeping things the way they are. 
OK. This is a completely different topic. Right now, we've gone through sectors one by one. And why have we done that? Because every sector is a little bit different. It's, it's important to talk a little bit about the ways they're different and how each one ought to be studied. But are we possibly missing something? One of the things that we could miss by looking at these one by one is interactions between sectors. And why is that important? Well, we're, we are limited in the amount of water we have. We're limited in the amount of land we have. We're, that's fixed. We're not getting more land, more water, fresh water. And one of the things you've got to be careful about is if you've got a plan in one sector that says, wow, I, you know, great thing for agriculture is let's just triple the amount of irrigation. Well, you've got to make sure that water is there. You can't just have that sector do this blindly. Because it could be that the water's already allocated, and there's no extra water for irrigation. Or the only water that you can get for irrigation is actually taken away from very high value uses. And, and you, it just doesn't make sense to take it from a high value use and give it to a low value use. So one of the things, one of the places where you've got to think about interactions is in the water area, and particularly water and agriculture, because agriculture uses so much water. Uh, that's a place where it's important these two sectors be studied together uh, so that you don't make mistakes. You don't think, well, I'm just going to do irrigation. That's my answer. Find out, well, actually, I can't do irrigation because when I look at the water sector, there's no water there. So that's one place. Land is the other. So the other thing that we've got to worry about is if the solution to agriculture is to increase our croplands, we've got to make sure we have increased croplands to get. So where is that generally going to come from? It's going to come from grassland or it's going to come from forest. So the foresters might be saying, ah, the solution to my forest problem, I'm going to increase forests. That's one of the things that we, we learned in the forestry talk. That's going to be a possibility. Where forests can grow might expand. But should it expand? One of the reasons Brent's model did not encourage forest land to expand in reality, even though the ecosystem model said that it should, is the place it was going to expand into is a high value crop area. Well, we, we're probably not going to want to expand forests into our most valuable cropland. That's probably not a smart move. And so we need to think about land. When we think about land, we may need to make sure that we're not double allocating it, giving it both to forestry and to agriculture, thinking they're both going to be just fine, but find out, well, shoot, we, we're, that, we're double counting this piece of land. We can't do that. So that's another place where it's important that, that these two sectors work together and that when they think of adaptation in agriculture, you, you also know what's going to happen in forestry so that the plan you're making is consistent between the two. OK, macroeconomics. We, we probably made a mistake by starting this entire conference with a macroeconomist talking about adaptation. That was probably a mistake. I, we, we didn't know that would happen, but it did. Um, why would we ever want to know about macroeconomics? It turns out that if what's going on in every sector turns out to be a big part the economy of a region, then it turns out it, it's possible that the climate impacts and adaptations may have big impacts on the entire economy. What are macroeconomic models about? They're trying to model the entire economy. That's what they do. Quite often, if, if the effects are very small or relatively small compared to the total economy, you can just study each sector one by one, and you're going to get most of the story correct. But if the effects are big, if agriculture is 70% of your economy, and, and all of a sudden agriculture is going to fall by 50% or something, that's going to have a huge effect on what's available for labor, what's going to happen to, to employment, what might happen to other interest rates, things that are going on inside your country. For that, you want to study a macroeconomic model. If it turns out climate change is going to make a huge impact on your economy, that your economy might shift by being 25% smaller, 50% bigger, those things will have macroeconomic consequences. And putting the thing into a macroeconomic model will tell you important information about what's going to happen to wages, what's going to happen to, to interest rates, what's going to happen to macroeconomic consequences. And so if you've got very big effects, macroeconomic models will be helpful to studying adaptation. Most of us are not going to see big effects this century unless climate change gets a lot worse than we think it is. The very tail of the possible things that might happen in climate change, we might see that. And 
That might be very important to get macro models. But for the next 50 years, the kinds of effects we're, we're expecting to see are going to be relatively small as a fraction of GDP. The economy isn't going to change very much in the near term, in the next 50 years. And for those, that period, macro models are not necessary. Wages will not change. Interest rates will not change. The kinds of things macro models are good at predicting aren't going to be affected by climate change in the near term. In the long term, they might be. And especially if we're talking about long term, very bad outcomes. They might be. And for that, you might want to have a macro model for that. But in the near term, for the next 40, 50 years, that's not likely. What's likely to happen in the next 40, 40 years is individual sectors might be affected a lot. But the economy as a whole is not, not expected to be. OK, so that, that's trying to give you a sense of why would you ever want a macro model. So you want it if you've got huge impacts relative to the size of your economy. What are we worried about macroeconomic models? Well, we're worried about macroeconomic models because they're modeling the entire economy. If you're modeling the entire economy, it turns out you're scanty on details. Why? Because you're trying to model everything. You're trying to model all of how Thailand works. How much detail can you have a model that covers all of Thailand? It turns out you, you economize on the details you include in those models. And there's an expression in English, the devil is in the details. But we could turn that around and say God is in the details. But, but it turns out the details are terribly important. And one of the things that, that is troublesome about macro models is most of the things we're talking about changing and adapting and, and fixing are invisible in macro models. They don't see them, which is why they don't understand what we're talking about. They, they cannot see details like climate. That's not an input in a macro model. Labor and capital are inputs. Climate doesn't exist in a macro model. So when you have climate changing, there's nothing in their model that, that says there's going to be any changes, which is why a macroeconomist is baffled when he's saying, well, why should I spend money on this? My model doesn't even have this in it. And, that, and he's, he's telling you the truth. That's true. His model does not have climate in it. And so it turns out the process of getting climate models and climate model results and adaptation into macro models is not trivial. And most of the macro models do not do a good job of including climate. And so one of the dangers in buying macro models is that they may not give you very much information. Because the models don't see climate, they don't know how to include climate, it turns out that a lot of the macro modeling is actually arbitrary. And it gives you arbitrary results. It might give you results you want to hear. So one of the things the macro model might want to wait and find out first. He finds out, well, do you want to know that adaptation is good for growth? Then I'll show you it's good for growth. I'll build a macro model that shows you it's good for growth. Do you want to show that it leads to lots of employment? I'll show you a macro model that shows that, that, that there'll be lots of employment. One, one of the things I'm worried about is you might be sold a bill of goods with macro models that they might be delivering something you want to hear. But it's not obvious that those things will actually happen.